Excellent. Welcome to the Metasploit team demo meeting in March now. It's coming in like a lion or whatever, going out like something else, I guess. I don't know. We've got a lot of cool stuff to cover today, a bunch of demos. We'll hop on in. We have some new modules, eight new modules to be exact. Our own Spencer McIntyre crafted up a cool new module targeting a .NET serialization vulnerability in the Microsoft Exchange Control Panel, ECP, web page. Vulnerable versions of Exchange don't randomize keys on a per installation basis, resulting in reuse of the same validation key and decryption key values. Exploiting this situation, this new module will craft a special view state to cause execution of an OS command as the system user using .NET deserialization, which this module leverages into code execution on the target. Enough said, that's pretty cool. I believe we'll have a demo of this. Community contributor owner ER provided a new module targeting open net admin, which is a tool for managing IP inventory. Version 18.1.1 skips some input validation, allowing this module to exploit that situation to achieve command injection via shell exec PHP function and ultimately code execution. In those three words folks like to hear, no authentication required. And we'll have a demo of this as well. Community contributor Eric Winter added a new module targeting Eyes of Network, an open source network management application. Vulnerable versions of the app, which appear to let's see, appear to be versions 3, 5.3 and prior, will allow this new module to create a new admin account either by generating an access token via hard-coded API key or by obtaining it via an SQL injection. After logging in as the newly created user, this module exploits a command injection vulnerability with root privileges. Also, no authentication required. And we'll have a demo of this one as well. Eric also provided a new module targeting a tar directory traversal vulnerability in Apache ActiveMQ on Windows, specifically versions 5.x to uh, prior to version 5.11.2. This vulnerability allows remote attackers to create JSP files in arbitrary directories leveraged by this new module to upload a JSP payload using the default creds, admin admin, or any other credentials provided by the user. Following successful payload upload to the target, this module issues an HTTP GET request to trigger the payload and obtain a session from the target. It's pretty cool. Our own Christophe De La Fuente dropped in a new exploit module targeting PHP FPM, where an underflow vulnerability and message parsing between Nginx and PHP can link to code execution on a vulnerable target with no authentication required. Versions containing this vulnerability are scattered about a bit. You can find them listed in the module box. And we'll have a demo of this, I believe. Contributor Tim Wright added a new exploit module targeting a type confusion vulnerability in Google Chrome 80.0.3987.87 through other versions prior to 80.0.3987.122 may also be vulnerable. Though other versions may also be vulnerable. This module will host a web page containing malicious JavaScript that, when visited by a vulnerable target, corrupts the length of the float array to achieve the ability to access a modified memory leading to remote code execution on vulnerable targets. Note that targets running Chrome with the sandbox enabled will be vulnerable. We'll have a demo of this as well. Tim also added a privilege escalation module which exploits a use after free vulnerability in Android Finder, which is the main inter-process communication system in Android. If delivered via the web, only a paired renderer exploit is required because it is accessible through the sandbox. There are a number of vulnerable Android devices, including the Pixel 2 and 2XL with Android 9 and 10 in the September 2019 security patch level. And worth noting that three malicious apps disguised as photography and file manager tools were found on the Google Play Store that exploit this vulnerability. Good times. So one, one thing that's kind of interesting is that if you were able to pair the Google Chrome 80 bug with the Android binder bug, you'd be able to break out the sandbox. The main reason why it doesn't work on Android is because Google Chrome that shipped on Android is 32-bit, and the um, binder bomb needs the kernel and the app to match the architecture oh. size. So that one little mitigation prevented that thing from being in this <laughs> Accidental security? Maybe yeah. <laughs> it's on purpose. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, awesome. yeah that's true. Uh, that's cool. Uh, and last on our list here, our own WBOO added a new local module targeting open SMTPD. Vulnerable versions of open SMTPD prior to version 6.6.4 contain an out of bounds read vulnerability in their NTA implementation allowing escalated command execution by an attacker at either the root or nobody user, depending on the grammar used by OpenSMTPD. Pretty cool. And we'll have a demo of this. 
And if you'd like to see a demo of the Open SMTPD Remote Code Execution Module planned two weeks back, check out the recording of our previous demo meeting where we showed that one off. All right, and a lot of other valuable work going on to talk about. Our community contributor, Sefer Victus, added a new SSH payload to transport, allowing a command shell via SSH connection. It's very cool. If you'd like to see a demo of this in action, again, the recording from our previous demo meeting has it. Check that out. Our own Spencer McIntyre added framework changes necessary to update REC socket parameters information with the proper bind address followed proper bind address by allowing the interpreter side to return additional TLVs containing extra information when a channel is open. Coupled with a interpreter implementation which leverages those TLVs, currently Windows, Python, and Metal do, uh, ensures the target will properly report the remote bind address of sockets, helping ensure things like SOX5 proxy connections do work correctly when pivoted through interpreter sessions. Very cool. Contributor Tim Wright added support for Windows 7 to his recent update of the <coughs> reverse PowerShell payload to support asynchronous reads on sockets. Nice. Community contributor Bartik added functionality and options to the reflective DLL injection module to make it more flexible and useful with third-party DLLs, such as allowing module-specific specified arguments to be passed to the DLL's entry point, output to be read from the targeted process, and for targeted process to be optionally be killed when done. Very cool. And our own Christophe de la Fuente added support for SMB2 to the pipe auditor of aux module, like that. And community contributor Adrian Vollmer added the framework side of changes to support RC4 encryption of payload, PowerShell payloads. It's very cool. And more. Uh, a few enhancements from our own Adam Galway here at the top. Uh, first in the, uh, the, in the list here, Adam added a new RPC endpoint, which returns the total number of modules in the ready, running, and result states. And I'm also added a usability update for sanitizing, sanitizing out prepended and appended path characters from module and payload options provided by the user. And Adam had a nice minor usability update that allows users to use type colon aux when searching auxiliary modules, not having to type out the full auxiliary. That's there. Uh, our own Alan Foster added the pry bybug gem to framework, providing useful debug capabilities for those doing metasploit development. Appreciate that. And our own Debbie Vu added support for colorized HTTP trace output to the framework HTTP client with an additional HTTP trace headers only option to only show HTTP headers when HTTP trace is enabled. This is very cool, particularly if you find yourself staring at a lot of HTTP traces. And more. <laughs> uh, I think this is the, the last one of enhancement. So our own Alan Foster improved error handling when a plugin fails to load, now displaying the reason for the failure, which is helpful. Alan also improved the error logging in Metasploit's Postgres protocol client when it encounters an unknown authentication type, providing meaningful feedback at that moment in time rather than raising an exception later. Our own Shelby Pace updated the SMB login scanner module to record a last attempted at value. Very cool. And Shelby also updated login scanners to work with username stored in the database via the DB all users option. Take that. First kind and first time contributor, I believe. OX 44, 43, 42, 41 added support for the DB all users option for the SMD enum users aux scanner module allowing framework users to store enumerated user names in the database. Dig that. And one bug fix also from our contributor X 44, 43, 42, 41. Uh, they also fixed a check method bug in the MS 16075 reflection juicy module where the Windows OS and build were not being parsed correctly due to changes in the client.sys.config lib. So appreciate that and hope to see X 44, 43, 42, 41 of the PRQ again sometime soon. And a bonus slide. Uh, we've had this bonus slide a few weeks in a row now, a few times in a row now. Um, we've talked some about our Attacker KB knowledge or Attacker Knowledge Base, also known as Attacker KB web app offering. It's a new resource to highlight hacker community knowledge on which phones matter most and why. We launched beta a few weeks back, adding, adding a gaggle of new users who had expressed interest in using Attacker KB. If you're interested in participating in the beta or just want to know more about Attacker KB, Caitlin put up an informative blog post link right there on the slide with more details about Attacker KB and info on how to sign up if you'd like to throw your hat in the ring for beta participation. Yeah. And I think you get stickers as well, right? I think. Um, and for details, or you can. Yeah. yeah. yeah you, there's, the details are, are there. There's also a Slack channel you can join to. Uh, and for details on recent framework activity, you can always check out the weekly Metasploit wrap-up blog post at blog.rapid7.com. And we do appreciate everybody who helps Metasploit better through their contributions. Thank you. All right, what everybody likes. 
Demos. Woo -hoo. Woo -hoo. Mr. Fuente, you, uh, you on? Yeah. Thanks, Pierce. Um, yeah. We'll stop sharing. Yeah. Okay. So, um, uh, well, so uh, OpenNet admin um, is uh, a network management application. And uh, this module exploits uh, remote code execution, which is basically uh, a common injection. Um, so we see uh, basic options. So we need to set the remote host, the um, yeah, remote ports, server ports, server host, if you have um, a listener, uh, the local host as well. And uh, that's it. So there's a check method as well, which is pretty cool. So this, uh, this will check the banners and uh, the, the version of the application. And uh, as you can see, it is vulnerable and we can run it. There we go. So I just wanted to have a look to the, like show you the code, which is very straightforward. So as you can see here, it's a post with um, a basic and straightforward command injection after the semicolon uh, in this uh, AJAX um, request. So there's an IP um, parameter here, and it's the, the payload gets injected just here. So it's uh, pretty straightforward. And here we go. We have a metaverse session. And uh, yeah, that's, that's it. Thanks, Gustav. And so we have an exchange ECP remote code execution demo. Spencer, you on the line? Yes, I am. Awesome. I will stop my share. Everyone able to see? There's a cow. Yeah. Excellent. The cow is good luck. So there yeah, so it's going to demonstrate the exchange ECP uh, view state deserialization vulnerability, which is a vulnerability due to exchange not randomizing the machine key utilized to validate the view state in the exchange control panel. That's what that ECP is. Uh, so the first thing that we're doing here is we're setting up all of the necessary parameters. This is unfortunately a authenticated vulnerability. However, the user, um, the username and password that needs to be used just needs to at least be a domain user with a mailbox that has already been set up in exchange. So there should be plenty of these within an environment. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and run through the check method. Now, the technique that this utilizes is going to recover the view state from the original exchange server, and it's going to try to calculate it out and make sure that we have the necessary information in order to be able to recalculate it, which is going to prove that we uh, can actually sign and create our own view state. Afterwards, and I've, I've paused it here, it's not hanging. Um, we're going to craft a view state and we're going to submit it in a Git request multiple times. Now it has to be in a Git request from my testing and all the different resources that were published that were vulnerable. It always has to be a Git request, which does lead to a relatively small size restriction. Um, but we can still utilize that with the command stager because it is fortunately large enough. And we're going to go ahead and use that to repeatedly upload uh, chunks of data into an executable that will ultimately run our payload and give us system code execution on the exchange server. And there we have it. So from domain user with a mailbox to system. And that's super cool. Any questions for Spencer? Dope. That's not a question. So, so, so that means that basically the threat model for any exchange user right now is any user compromise without this patch leads to domain admin access. So that's pretty powerful. Thank you. Yeah, eyes of network remote code execution, shall we? Um, so yeah, as kind of uh, previously stated, um, eyes of network is kind of this um, <clears throat> network monitoring tool. Um, this particular module kind of uh, it exploits multiple vulnerabilities to first uh, gain access to the tool and then it uh, goes and uh, actually exploits a command injection vulnerability to actually get code execution. Um, so the first step is actually um, you can either gain, uh, you can either create uh, a user account by uh, exploiting a SQL injection vulnerability or actually uh, 
leveraging the fact that uh, a hard-coded uh, admin API key uh, well, is hard-coded. Um, so let me see if I can so show some of the requests. Basically, yeah, you can use the, uh, I'm using the uh, admin key because I'm running straight out the box. But you basically create an account and then, oh, okay, so it did open. And then you can go and uh, actually log into that account and uh, create uh, a request in the target parameter of an auto discovery job that basically writes a command to, uh, to the system. Um, trying to find it. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, once you actually write the command, you get code execution as root. Nice. Uh, maybe I should have just used the headers. Um, yeah, oh, here's the actual auto discovery job that you write. It writes uh, an auto discovery job uh, and gets code execution that way. It's kind of hard to read there, but yeah, you get code execution as root. <clears throat> Neat. Uh, any questions? That's great. I really, really like the new HTTP call rate stuff. Yeah, the headers only, I think, um, usually. Oh, is that well? The headers only can clean that up a little bit, like Shelby yeah. said, because um, the body usually is a little long. <laughs> yeah. Shelby had suggested that after scrolling back a little bit. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Shelby. All right. I think we're going to kick it back to Mr. McIntyre for a demo of the PHP FPM underflow remote code execution. That's um, right. I'm back. He's back. <laughs> he me to uh, demo his as well. Super hack. <laughs> uh, so this vulnerability is an underflow in the PHP FPM, which is a process that connects the front end web server, uh, typically like Nginx, with the back end PHP engine. Um, so in the way that it communicates, there is a vulnerability that allows the attacker um, through our Metasploit module uh, to inject directives to that backend engine, which we can then utilize to obtain code execution. Uh, so one of the tricks behind this is trying to find the necessary possible uh, lengths, which we can go ahead and we can see right here. Uh, the module is going to go ahead and try to fingerprint that for us. That way we can get um, those correct values here and then go ahead and utilize that to execute our payload. Uh, it takes just a couple seconds here once it says the interpreter session is open, and that's because there's a very critical step towards the end where the module needs to clean up after itself in order to allow for reliable re-execution of the vulnerability. So it does just hang here for about a minute in my testing, um, but other than that, it, it or th and that doesn't even affect reliability, but it, it's reliable and able to clean up after itself. And spoiler alert, we can actually see the countdown here. So just a few more seconds. Uh, and there yeah. you go. It's like Jurassic Park with their video calls or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Very nice. Any questions for Spencer? <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Spencer. Appreciate it. Oh, wait. There's more. Open SMTPD. This is the Privesk. Mr. Vu? Hello. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Great. Let Loud me share this. I think I have everything not scrambling for time. <laughs> so so uh, over here, we have our OpenBSD system. It's a 6.6. .6. Uh, I've also written a, a target for 6.3 and below, I believe. Um, I'll only be demoing the new style grammar for uh, uh, OpenSMTPD. And that's anything uh, past a certain commit from, I think, uh, a year or two ago. So, um, yeah, let's get started. Um, if we do this, we should be able to see two of the modules. Um, I can actually demonstrate both of them, but I won't because uh, of time here. So we can use the first one. That's the local privilege escalation. We do info here. We can see, you know, a bunch of info about it. <clears throat> oh, that's right. We actually need a session because it's a local privilege escalation. So we will use first one. Oops. Okay, that's right.
There you go. <laughs> uh, I don't know if I went through that too quickly. It's that easy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I logged in with SSH here as me. <clears throat> Got a shell. Um, it's running as an unprivileged user. And then we flip back to the module with previous here options. Only we really need L host. Um, there's also a show missing command, but I won't demo it there. But uh, yeah, here it goes. It checks <clears throat> for the grammar type being used, sees it's vulnerable, um, pops a listener, runs this command over here, this lovely sunmill command, and um, waits for a connection back from the client because the uh, daemon uh, connects back in client mode and uh, fakes an SMTP server and send and expects a bunch of stuff here. Um, sends this lovely block here, um, which changes it to MDA mode, mail delivery mode, and um, runs this command here. And then that gets you root in this grammar, in the older style grammar, it gets you uh, nobody or unprivileged shell, and you can see 6.6 .6 here matches 6.6 .6 here. And uh, you can see here's our shell, which I should have done last time instead of playing with ktrace. And Eat. yeah, um, one second. All right, so here's the RC as well. So um, just for comparison's sake, uh, it will also get you the same privilege level as local privilege escalation. <clears throat> and that yeah. one is uh, only limited to the newer style grammar. That's the, the open SMTPD RCE module? Yeah, newer? correct. Okay, got it. Yeah, cool, neat. Yep, that's all I got. Got a twofer. Any questions for Will? Good stuff, thanks Will. Yeah, thank you, Will. We have one more demo related to the framework portion of this meeting. Mr. Adam Galway, Adam, you on the line? Yes, sir. Cool, I'm going to start this thing up here if you wanna walk yeah, us sure. through it. Cool, so awesome. This, yep, this is a vulnerability released by Tim WR and it's an exploit of Google Chrome, which is pretty compli complicated and allows you to basically overwrite a float array, which allows you to write to adjacent memory and absolute memory, and then process memory. So this module starts up uh, malicious JavaScript that does all that for you on the server. So that's what you're seeing there. Then you can set the payload to an interpreter, starts it running. Uh, unfortunately, at the moment, uh, you have to run Google Chrome without sandbox enabled. So and here we are accessing the malicious site. Uh, it just hangs on the user's end, but as you go back into the terminal, it's popped a session. And from there, you can go on and do all your evil malicious things. And that's more or less it. Very nice. Excellent. <laughs>